Today we're looking at Thessaly. Thessaly is the region of northern Greece. This area was fairly populous and we know that it was an important part of the ancient Greek world. Yet, as we'll see, our knowledge of this area is actually quite limited. Largely, this is due to the interest of our sources who tend to focus on the larger cities, say Athens, Sparta, or some of the cities of Anatolia. In this video, what I'll show is that Thessaly had quite a few cities of its own, but that there were some major differences between the way in which these polis operated and the ways in which the more fully independent polis of the south operated. We'll also look at the contributions of the Thessalians to the larger whole of Greek history. And at the end, I will highlight our collective ignorance of ancient history in Thessaly by showing that there was an entire large city which was more or less completely unknown until 2016. Let's be more precise about the geography of Thessaly. Thessaly is located in the northeast corner of Greece north of central Greece, separated from it by Thermopylae and some other mountainous features. It is also south of Macedon, separated by the Vale of Tempe. If, to put it a little more poetically, I suppose one could say that Thessaly is bounded in the north by Mount Olympus and by Mount Ida in the south. This means that Thessaly certainly has its mountainous parts, and that it is centrally located in the Greek world since Mount Olympus in the northern part of Thessaly is a major and iconic part of Greek culture and religion. Many Greeks would have been familiar with Thessaly if they traveled to the Olympic Games. So Thessaly was not some distant backwater and it certainly wasn't too far off the beaten path. While it is seen as not quite as civilized as areas like, say, Attica or Boeotia, it certainly was not completely at the end of the world or anything of that nature. To the west of Thessaly is Epirus. The two of them are separated by the Pindus Mountains. We'll talk about Epirus in another video very soon. Thessaly was famous in antiquity as being some of the best horse country around. And while it was decent for growing grain, it was actually a lot better suited for pasturage, hence all of the horses. As we'll see, the Salian cavalry gained quite a reputation for fearsomeness during this period, say the Archaic and Classical periods and well down into the Hellenistic period. Thessaly also plays a prominent role in Greek mythology. Thessaly was the site of the Titanomachy, which was the great ten-year war between the Titans and the Olympian gods. If you want to learn more about that war, I suggest reading Hesiod's Theogony. Jason and the Argonauts also began their quest for the Golden Fleece from none other than Thessaly. They actually came from a region of Thessaly called Magnesia, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. The two cities that Jason and the Argonauts met at and then departed from were Iolcus, which was Jason's place of birth, and the nearby city of Pagasai. Both of these ancient cities are encompassed within the confines of the modern city of Volos. We'll talk a good deal more about these sites in particular. One of the groups within Thessaly, one of the early tribes, were called the Magnetes. They, of course, gave the peninsula that they lived on the name of Magnesia, and they established two colonies in Anatolia which bore their name, Magnesia on the Meander and Magnesia ad Sipilum. That is not mythological, but I put it on this slide because, you know what, there's only so much space in a presentation, and sometimes there are things you got to say which just don't warrant an entire slide onto themselves. If we include prehistory in our overall account of Thessalian history, it goes back to at least 6000 BCE. In Thessaly, we can find Neolithic, Chalcolithic, and Mycenaean remains. Homer claims that in his time, Thessaly was the home of four different distinct groups, the Pelasgians, the pre-Greek inhabitants of um, Greece, the Peribi, Magnetes, of course the Magnesians, and the Aeolians. 
By the classical period, whatever the truth may have been about the early archaic, we know that the Aeolian dialect had become dominant. So if these tribes were in fact real, then clearly the Aeolians became culturally dominant. That being said, clearly the Magnesians also maintained quite a bit of cultural staying power since they gave their name to two colonies in Asia Minor and also um, gave their name to one, the peninsula that you see on the eastern side of Thessaly. While Thessaly will remain important in the Greek world as a source of horses and some goods, also of course as an area to pass through the go to the Olympic Games, it will not really be that internationally prominent until it starts to more fully develop and urbanize going into the 4th century BCE. As a quick programming note, I would like to reiterate that our knowledge of Thessaly is very incomplete and that our knowledge of Thessaly cities is especially embarrassing in its paucity. Some of this is due to building over old sites during the Middle Ages and also sometimes even in later antiquity. However, um, we are learning more over time. We'll start out with the city of Iolcus. Iolcus, of course, is supposed to be the birthplace of Jason of Jason and the Argonauts fame. During the late Archaic and Classical periods, Iolcus was a small city. Apparently, it wasn't considered to be all that big of a deal since in 510, when Hippias of Athens was expelled during the Democratic Revolution, or at least the early phase of the Democratic Revolution, the Magnesians were willing to offer the city up to their ally Hippias of Athens, but he thought the city was a little too small for his taste, so he declined and went to Persia to beg for an army with which to reconquer Athens. Iolcus had enough prosperity during the 4th century to mint its own coins. Most likely they maintained a relationship with Athens and that is where their silver came from. To the best of my knowledge, there are no silver mines in this particular area of Thessaly. For reasons that I'll get into soon, the city died off completely during the 3rd century BCE. Next up, we have another nearby small polis, Pagasai. While Pagasai is indeed small, it was considered important enough that it lent its name to the Pagasidic Gulf. This gulf opens up onto the large island of Euboea, which was an important agricultural area. So most likely a lot of the trade out of Pagasai was to and from Euboea and Attica, which were not very far away at all. Pagasai was fairly well positioned compared to most of the other ports in the area. The city emptied out completely after the foundation of Demetrios. Spoiler alert, that is the event I alluded to earlier when I was talking about the previous city of Iolcus. Pagasai was then restored in the Roman period, unlike Iolcus, and served as the port of the city of Pharae, which we'll talk about in a while, by the time of the geographer Strabo, who lived in the late first century BCE and into the early decades of the first century CE. Interestingly enough, even though the city had to have been located in a, within a fairly small area, there are a number of small cities which have now been encompassed by the modern city of Volos, so it's not entirely clear which little set of ruins was, is to be associated with Pagasai. However, we know the general area where it's at, and it's not unreasonable to think that some of the residents of Pagasai may have once enjoyed the view that you see here on the screen. Before we move any further, I think that it behooves us to speak of Demetrios, the city which demanded the sacrifice of Iolcus and Pagasai. Demetrios was a Hellenistic foundation by the successor general and king Demetrius Polyorchides. Polyorchides means the besieger. He was the son of Antigonus the One-Eyed and he was famous for his siege craft. This in general also meant that he was very skilled when it came to military engineering, and he actually chose a strategic site, which was a little better situated than any of the existing cities to take full advantage of the Pagasidic Gulf. 
he founded the city in 294 BCE in order to find citizens to serve as settlers for this new place he ordered the nearby Polace to be evacuated and all of their citizens to move in to his new settlement at Demetrios. That was not an uncommon practice, by the way, for ambitious rulers to order other cities to consolidate themselves into new foundations, which would serve as strategic centers bearing their name. About half a century, maybe a little more, after Demetrius's uh, foundation, in fact, it would be closer to 70 or 80 years later, Macedonian king Philip V called Demetrius one of the three fetters of Greece. He thought that by controlling the city, you effectively had a stranglehold on Thessaly. The other fetters were cities like Corinth, which controlled the passage between central and southern Greece. So this site was quite well chosen by Demetrius, and it would perhaps not unintentionally serve as a way to keep a stranglehold on Thessaly for the rulers out of Macedon. At the time, Demetrius was actually the king of Macedon, although um, if you know anything about his life, you know that his fortunes varied dramatically and that at various points in his life he ruled very different areas. The city was ultimately destroyed, but it was then rebuilt by Justinian I, who reigned as the emperor of Eastern Rome from 527 to 565 CE. Later on, the city, which still existed, was held by the Catalan Company, and this group of men tried to resist the Ottomans during the 14th century. However, they eventually abandoned the city in the 14th, late 14th, and then early 15th centuries for the rising Greek city of Volos, which of course then encompassed this city as well. Moving inland and north, we come to the city of Crenon. Crenon is not a very famous site, and if not for a battle fought there, it would almost certainly not have been on my radar to include in this video. Crannon produced an Olympic victor in 648 BCE, perhaps the only one that it ever produced. During the Peloponnesian War, Crannon, as well as the majority of Thessaly, sided primarily with Athens. Then when the Corinthian War broke out in 394, Cranon found itself once again aligned with Athens and Athens' allies Argos and Corinth. Cranon's primary claim to fame is much like the primary claim to fame of cities like uh, Chironea and Plataea in Boeotia, and that is that it was the site of a major battle which was one of the turning points in Greek history. The Battle of Crannon was the decisive battle of the Lemian War, which was waged from 323 to 322. Basically what happened in the Lemian War is that news arrived of Alexander's death in Babylon, and then the Athenians led a grand revolt of the Greeks against Macedon. At first they were successful, and the Athenian general Leosthenes inflicted a defeat on the Macedonian regent Antipater. However, Leosthenes died in the battle, and then um, the Macedonians were able to stage a comeback when they got reinforcements from another successor general named Craterus. The Athenians, for their part, failed to produce another great general, and they also did not reduce Antipater with their siege, so they were defeated both on land and then in a separate sea battle, and that spelled the end of Greek independence. This is when the Macedonians really cracked down on the Greeks, um, Athenian democracy ends after the Lemian War. It will be restored, but that's a different story for a different day and not directly relevant to the history of Cranon, except insofar as the Battle of Cranon is what the Crannonites are known for. That being said, Cranon was not necessarily a small or poor city. It had enough resources and wealth to warrant minting silver coins in the 5th century, but then only bronze in the 4th century. I assume that the difference in the coinage, that downgrade from silver to bronze, is because they must have had a much closer relationship with Athens during the 5th century. And of course, Athens was one of the most uh, prolific producers of silver. 
whereas in the 4th century, the Athenian mines at Lorion were not super productive again until about the middle of the century. So there was about a 50-year period where Athens was not producing nearly as much silver due to massive hemorrhaging of population, especially in terms of slaves in the late part of the Peloponnesian War. Cranon has surprisingly few archaeological remains, but we have reason to believe that the city contained a number of temples, which again is evidence that the city was pretty prosperous. It's possible the city had temples to Athena Polios, the healing god Asclepius, Apollo, who interestingly enough could also serve as a healing god and was the father of Asclepius, Poseidon, and Zeus. Next up, we have the Greek polis of Pharsalus. Pharsalus was a full-fledged polis, which seems to have been largely independent. It seems to have had enough power to not really have been influenced by some of the factors we'll get into, which limited the independence of many of the cities of Thessaly. It was built on an imposing hillside not far from the southwestern border of Thessaly. Just like many of the polis in Thessaly, Pharsalus was within the Athenian orbit for most of the 5th century and into part of the 4th as well, despite being an inland city. This shows that Athens had a pretty strong relationship with all of Thessaly, and part of that may have been because the inland areas also were producers of timber, which the Athenians needed in order to build and maintain their two to three hundred ship fleet. During the mid fourth century, the Thessalians sided with Philip II of Macedon, and Pharsalus seems to have fallen in line a little easier than some of the other cities of Thessaly, which were more directly in his line of attack. It's possible that Pharsalus sided with Philip more voluntarily because they were more afraid of the tyranny of their immediate neighbors than they were of the king in the north. In the Hellenistic period, interestingly enough, Pharsalus found itself in a much different role. It was the key center in the struggle against Macedonian hegemony, at least among the Thessalians. Culturally, Pharsalus was also somewhat relevant in the ancient world. Euripides' play Andromaca was actually set in Pharsalus. Of course, if you have heard of Pharsalus before, the reason is none of the things I've mentioned before, but rather that Pharsalus was the decisive battle between Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus in 48 BCE. In this battle, Caesar, who had been forced to retreat previously, had his back to the wall, his men were kind of hungry, and Pompey had a big numerical advantage. Yet Caesar managed to turn the tables on him defeat him entirely, and then mounted a pursuit to Egypt where the um, pharaoh decided that the best course of action was to have Pompey beheaded and then try to make friends with Caesar. Caesar had to fight some other opponents, but this was really the end of him having an opponent who was anywhere near his level. So Caesar would go on to win the civil wars, and then of course he got assassinated and that started the new round of civil wars. but. This isn't the history of the Roman Republic. This is the uh, exploration of Thessaly. And as I mentioned before, many of the cities that we're looking at today have been negatively impacted by subsequent history in terms of us being able to unlock and understand their ancient past. Pharsalus, unfortunately, is no exception to that. Between World War II bombing and then an earthquake in 1954, there are very, very few remains from the ancient and medieval worlds. One of the, uh, one of the few ex exceptions is the thing pictured on your screen. Perhaps the best known city in all of Thessaly was Larissa. Larissa was a polis which was dominated in its early years by the aristocratic Aluidae family. And the Aluidae would come in time to control pretty much all of Western Thessaly and even have a lot of influence in other parts of the region. However, by the classical period, Larissa had established a democracy. That being said, it is surprisingly not incompatible 
for democracies in the Greek world to have a lot of very strong and prominent aristocratic families represented. Athens during the 5th century, to give one example, had a number of very prominent aristocratic families and many of the leading politicians, including Pericles, came from the most famous families in the city's history. In the 4th century that changed some, but in Larissa, uh, this never really changed so far as we know. It's also worth noting that when I talk about the fact that Larissa was governed internally by a democracy, there's only a small period for which we have this attestation, and I believe it's something like 380 to 360 or something like that. And we don't really know its internal affairs otherwise, so it's possible that this was a blip in the radar and it was actually an oligarchy for most of its history. But again, we really don't know because the amount written about Thessaly in terms of the details is very limited. One detail we have from later sources is that there was a regional festival which centered around Larissa that was uh, fairly similar to the Roman Saturnalia. That is where slaves and masters would switch roles for a period of time and this was a way to kind of relieve social tension and it also had some unknown religious significance as well. Larissa is famous as the hometown of Mino, who was both a general and a philosopher. Mino, in many ways, was both a contemporary of Xenophon and more or less the Larissan version of the Athenian Xenophon. Both of them served as generals for Cyrus the Younger's army during the um, civil war between Cyrus and Artaxerxes, and both of them helped to get the Greeks back out of Persia. Mino, as a philosopher, was famous enough that when he went to Athens and supposedly got into a debate with Socrates, he was important enough that at discussion for Plato to name an entire dialogue after him. While neither Hippocrates, the famous doctor, nor the philosopher Gorgias of Leontini, who supposedly is a friend of Mino, were of Larissan birth, both of them supposedly did die in Larissa. I suppose that is significant in some way. Another interesting fact about Larissa is that unlike a number of sites we've looked at today, this one has been continually inhabited down to the present. Speaking of the Aluadi, the dominant aristocracy of Larissa, they were able to extend their tendrils throughout Thessaly probably mostly through intermarriages and possibly also through some kind of conquest. The exact way in which they were able to extend their tendrils is not entirely clear. Again, we don't really know a lot of the details of Thessalian history. Until the time of Jason and Alexander of Pharae, members of the Aluadi tended to serve as Tagus of Thessaly. Not to go too much into detail on the political arrangements of Thessaly, which are also not super well understood, but there was an office called the Tagus, which is effectively something like the league leader or something along those lines. It was someone who was loosely speaking the leader of all of Thessaly, but this person might not quite qualify as a king because the degree of his control was somewhat modest. That being said, it was still an office you would like to have if you had the, op had the option of either having it or not having it. Under Jason and Alexander, the office of Tagus was transformed significantly, as we'll see later. The Aluadi, after the downfall of Jason and Alexander, were restored to power by Philip II of Macedon. However, um, what ended up happening is while they were ostensibly restored to power, in reality, Philip began to make Thessaly a major satellite of Macedon. And the power of the Aluadi will fade rapidly by the end of the 4th century. In fact, the last attested member of the family will be a friend and companion at court for Antigonus the One-Eyed, the father of Demetrius the Besieger, a gentleman we've already met today. Moving east, returning to Magnesia, we come to the polis of Pharae. According to Homer, uh, 
Pherae was the home of King Admetus and Queen Alcestis. Admetus had once hosted Heracles, and the two of them had gotten along famously, Heracles feeling indebted to Admetus due to the extent of the king's hospitality toward him. So when he heard that Hades had abducted Queen Alcestis, Heracles went to the underworld in order to rescue her and return her to her husband. So the point of the story is that if Heracles visits you, you should make sure that you serve him all the best wine and boar because one day you might need him to rescue a loved one from Hades. The city was located near the Podgesitic Gulf, but not close enough to serve as a port. As we noted earlier, by the time of Strabo in the first century BCE, Pharae had to rely upon Pagasai as a port. So far as we can tell, Pharae was not a terribly important place during the fifth century, but it emerged as a great power in the fourth century and served as the seat of Jason and Alexandra Pharae, who were not only able to unite all of Thessaly, but were able to contend for hegemony even as far south as central Greece. In a previous video on Thebes, I talked about how the general Pelopidas led campaigns in the Thessaly, and his primary opponent during all of those campaigns was Pharae and the alliance of Thessalians that it led. So now let's turn to the two most famous residents of Pharae, Jason and Alexander. Jason of Pharae inherited the position of Tagus from his father. His father seems to have seized control and then died not long afterwards, meaning that it's possible that Jason as the heir apparent had been more or less governing before he actually became Tagus. During the 370s, Jason looked poised to accomplish great things. He managed to unite Thessaly in a meaningful sense, one of, if not the first person to do something like that. And then he was able to hire 6,000 mercenaries, which suggests that he was very financially secure. He not only was able to intervene in Macedon to the north, but he also began to threaten central Greece with his army. His actual ambitions are not well known, and it's possible that he simply wanted to control Thessaly and maybe exercise a little bit of power in the border regions of Macedon, Epirus, and a little bit of, say, focus. However, um, Jason would be assassinated in 370 due to some pretty questionable reasons. And within a year or so, following the rule of one of his younger brothers, another brother, or perhaps even Jason's son, Alexander, would come to power. It was most likely Jason who was the more powerful of the two, however, and it is Jason who serves the larger role in Greek history, at least in most of the narratives that you might encounter. The reason for this is that Jason was famous enough that the Athenian orator and Panhellenist Isocrates actually wrote him a work where he exhorted Jason to unite all of the Greeks against Persia. He thought that in Jason, the Greeks had finally produced a leader who was worthy of uniting all of Greece under one banner. The idea of Panhellenism arose during the 4th century, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is all of the Greeks coming together. Um, so Isocrates, interestingly enough, the first person that he saw as worthy of such leadership was Jason of Pharae. So this implies that Jason had a fair amount of charisma and that he was a pretty effective ruler, but of course his assassination would render all of that largely irrelevant. Um, also, a lot of scholars think that Jason of Pharae's rise was kind of a blueprint for Philip II of Macedon, who of course was then able to pass his power on to another man named Alexander. As for Jason's son and or brother Alexander, I guess it had to be either or, um, it couldn't be both, unless they had a really messed up family tree. I don't really know how they did things in Foray, but I'm going to guess probably not that way. So Alexander, once he takes power in Foray, had to endure a Thessalian revolt and a Theban invasion. 
he is the guy who ends up fighting against Palapados since um, Jason didn't quite live long enough to confront Theban armies marching north. The Athenian general Leosthenes, who I mentioned earlier as the guy who won but then lost his life during the Battle of Cranon, uh, he ended up defeating Alexander in a battle. However, the context of this battle is that Alexander had actually invaded Attica. So he was in Athenian home territory, which was a pretty rare achievement in the 4th century since the Athenians had heavily fortified all of Attica to prevent enemies from laying waste to their countryside. So after Leosthenes defeated his army, Alexander showed quite a bit of moxie because he actually stole some nearby Athenian triremes and then raided the Athenian naval arsenal at Piraeus, the port. And this was also another heavily fortified area. I assume the only reason he was able to get in is because he was sailing in Athenian ships with the distinctive uh, owls on the front. So the people manning the gates to the harbor would have let these ships in, assuming that these are Athenians. So Jason got in, stole a few things, and got the hell out. Or, excuse me, Alexander. Jason was dead by this point. Just like his father slash brother, depending on what their relation was, Alexander II came to be assassinated. In 357 to 356, his wife Thebe decided to assassinate him, and there were a number of reasons that ancient authors offer up for this decision, but it's possible that there wasn't really much of a motive, and it was just a personal feud between husband and wife. In absolute monarchies of any kind, a lot of the reasons for assassinations are often incredibly dumb by modern standards because we sometimes don't understand honor cultures very well. Um, a lot of the decisions that ancient aristocrats and kings made were not driven by anything that we would recognize as rational. And especially for people who were not on the throne themselves, sometimes they would act in ways that are extraordinarily melodramatic and sometimes, to be frank, a little bit stupid. Before we move on to just how ignorant we are about Thessaly as a whole and how much we could and should know about the region, I'd like to highlight the reason why Thessaly was so renowned during antiquity. The Thessalian Cavalry. Thessalian horses and horsemen were renowned throughout the Greek world for their prowess. Even after the rise of Macedon, which became known for, among other things, its excellent cavalry corps, the Thessalians were still highly sought after, and they were almost or possibly even as good as the Macedonians at their best. The Thessalians in the 5th century were well known enough that the Athenians, who were the financially dominant power of the time, would hire them frequently for expeditions. They knew that the Thessalians were simply better than their homegrown cavalry corps and that they would do a much better job of screening, pursuit, and all of the other tasks that ancient cavalry performed. Philip and Alexander, as I mentioned, developed their own Macedonian cavalry. However, they still relied quite heavily on Thessalians to serve as a supplement and to give them the kind of mobility and numbers that they needed to be truly effective. We can really see the importance of the Thessalian cavalry best exemplified by Alexander's great field battles against the Persians. He fought three great battles at um, Isis, Gagamela, and the Granicus. Actually, the order would be the Granicus, Isis, and Gagamela. And in each of these battles, the Thessalians will play a key role. At the Granicus, if memory serves me correct, there was a squadron of Thessalian cavalry which entered the river first to serve as a decoy, so that way the Persians would move out of position, and this allowed the Macedonian cavalry to strike a decisive blow and then gain the other bank and cross in the face of the enemy, which would have been a hard task had the Thessalians not created the diversion. At both Isis and especially at Gagamela, the strategy for Alexander was to overwhelm his enemy on the right flank while he uh, while um, the Thessalians with his general Parmenian would hold down the left against superior numbers waiting for Alexander to win and then roll up the enemy from the other side. 
At Gagamella, they'd really proved their worth because their flank was massively outnumbered and overwhelmed, yet the Thessalians were able to hold firm until Alexander could rout the enemy in front of him, launch a brief pursuit, and then double back to rescue them. So the Thessalians were absolutely key to the conquest of Alexander, and without them, it's very hard to imagine that the armies of Alexander would have been able to overrun the entirety of the Persian Empire. So while we know a good deal about how the Thessalians were at cavalry warfare, we need to learn more about their cities, their customs, and even where some of their cities were located. And in order to really highlight the extent of our ignorance, I now turn to a recently discovered site, which the world only learned about in the distant year of 2016. Let us end at the site of Strongilo Vuni. I'm assuming that's approximately how you pronounce it in modern Greek. I actually am not at all familiar with modern Greek pronunciation, so I probably butchered that badly, but let's just ignore that. This is a recently discovered site in western Thessaly, which is typically thought to have been a backwater, with the exception, of course, of Pharsalus, which was located in the south of Thessaly, not far from central Greece. As for Strangilavuni, this is located on top of a 700 foot tall hill. The site's name derives in fact from the name of the hill. Perhaps as we explore it we may assign it a different name, especially if it starts to match a description that we know from a, a, an existing source. Most likely however it will just be named after this hill and that will remain its name for the time being. The reason that we discovered Strongilovuni is because there was an effort to do a grand archaeological survey of Thessaly, which has been not very well explored up to this point. Earlier archaeologists and explorers found a few remains on top of the hill, and they just assumed that this was a very minor site, which had no real significance, perhaps even just a mere village. However, when the area was explored with a ground penetrating radar, we found that in fact, this was a fairly major city. The site covered about 98 acres, and we know from pottery fragments that were found that it flourished from the fifth until the third centuries. Most likely it was founded around 500 or so and then abandoned during the third century, perhaps due to Macedonian or Roman activity. While we don't yet have a full picture of Strangilavuni, we do know that it has an agora, walls, towers, city gates, and a street pattern. So this is a full-fledged Greek polis by any other name, even if it bears a modern Greek name from a hill that I can't pronounce. So never forget, when it comes to Thessaly, what we know is completely inadequate, and we need to research more on this area, do a lot more archaeological exploration, and really just get a fuller picture of the role that Thessaly played in the larger Greek world. And we can only really appreciate that role by really understanding the full extent of Thessaly's material wealth, its population numbers, its economic activity, and hopefully we'll even uncover some stels which will really highlight and uh, demonstrate what the people there were thinking and what they were up to. So that is all I have on this subject. We will shortly talk about Epirus.